Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Daily Objective. And today, of course, is Freedom Friday. And we have something very special to talk about and a special guest. There's something I've been uh, coming to terms with, some, some new information that's very difficult for me to process. There, uh, there is politics outside of the United States. I, I'm, I'm as surprised as all of you. This is something I'm, I'm learning to understand. There actually is a world outside of the United States. There is such a thing as the need for liberty outside of the US and there is politics. And today we're gonna be talking about a country that's actually not in the United States. That's a separate, separate place. And, but, but it's still gonna be a, a discussion about liberty. Come with me on this journey into the unknown. I'll pass it over to a man who, let's just say, uh, if I had to pick one country where liberty might have a chance outside of the U.S., as unlikely as it is, it has to be the birthplace of rule of law, as far as I understand history. A man whose name I pronounce perfectly every day, Nikos Sotirikapoulos. Thank you very much. Thank you. So today we, we are going to discuss uh, Lebanon. And if you, if you remember some... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we said that we don't feel that we are in a position to discuss it because we were lacking context, we were lacking the special knowledge. But today, this issue is resolved because we have someone who actually can talk about it. And this is my friend Leopold Ajami. Am I pronouncing the surname correctly? Yes. Yes. Good. So Leopold is someone who is, we were let's say, in the same class in OAC. Actually, no, I think you were a year older than me in the Objectivist Academic Center. And I've met him in some Objectivist conferences, but lately he has started doing something very interesting. So Leopold is running the Novel Philosophy Academy, and you will see the link on the Facebook post. And what, is, what this institution is doing is basically providing, let's say, advice based on philosophy. And I've been to some of the workshops of Leopold, and what, is, what I find fascinating is how you concretize philosophical abstractions to simple concretes based on popular culture, based on sports. And also, I would encourage people to follow uh, specifically the Instagram page of, uh, of uh, Novel Philosophy Academy, because not only you're running interesting meetings and workshops, but also your posts are very interesting. So I think the last post was about how to have discussions on the first date. And you see the title, you might say, oh, that's gonna be something cheesy. No, there's philosophy there, there's Socrates there, there's always kind of an objectivist kind of undercurrent running around your post. So I, I encourage people to, to check your work because I think it's something that is missing from the wider, let's say, milieu and something that I've really enjoyed. But Leopold, today we're not talking about uh, your work as an entrepreneur, but we go more towards your knowledge on the case of Lebanon. So we had this disaster a couple of weeks ago, this explosion that left so many people homeless and that in a way brought into surface with the, dra the political drama that has been unfolding in mm -hmm. Lebanon. So in very few words, for someone who doesn't know much, and they only know that Lebanon is somewhere in the Middle East and there's something called Hezbollah and they're not in good terms with Israel. So what has been the model of politics and of governance and of government in Lebanon for the last years or for the last decades? And why is it not a good model? Well, briefly put, uh what they call it a democracy, but it's really based on uh, sectarianism. So after the war, and I, I guess this is where the tragedy happened because nobody won in that war, really. And, and you're referring war, to the civil war that also- To the civil war. To the civil war, yeah, so which yeah. ended uh, in the 90s, right? So nobody really won and they came to an agreement, which is known as the Taif Agreement, right? And they segmented uh, the government based on uh, sects. So that's what happened. So now, the, for example, the president has to be Christian Maronite. He has to be. You don't have a choice. Uh, the prime minister has to be uh, Sunni. 
uh, Muslim Sunni. So it's segmented this way, and this actually developed um, into everything else related to the government, into everything else related to any uh, any political class or even managerial. Like now you can't even go into any uh, company unless you have uh, some, you know, you're backed up by some favors, right? And that's the problem. So it's it's really a mess, uh, and I'm sure you've heard there's now like a hyperinflation. The economy is is in a complete disaster. Um, and, and this was they, let's say to people this was before the tragedy with the explosion. So the problems yes. were accumulating before that. Yes. Yes. So what happened after this uh, disaster? You had this post on Instagram, which is called Lebanon's Oath, which really, uh, you know, it was very, it touched many people. So actually I didn't see it on that time, but a common friend told me you need to check this out. So what I thought we'd do today is we're gonna go through this, shall I call it, let's say, it's something between a poem and a constitution of values for Lebanon. So I don't know how you envisioned it, but it's very beautiful. So we're gonna go through it paragraph by paragraph. You're gonna tell us what situation in reality influence you to tell us these things and what it means. And then we're also gonna get the commentary from Raqqa. So okay. let's start with the first lines. In the name of my life, from this moment on, I will choose to live. I will not sacrifice my life anymore, nor ask anyone to sacrifice theirs, nor think of the innocents who died as martyrs, for that is the language of those who demand sacrifice. So the first lines, Leopold, they make sense. It's also this theme that we saw in Atlas Shrugged. I live my life not sacrificing for others, not sacrificing as myself. What caught my attention, though, is that line which says that I will not think of the innocents who died as martyrs. And specifically in the Middle East, we quite often hear the term martyr. Yeah. So what's your problem with the term? And why, why do you consider it as the language of those who demand sacrifices? So first, let me give you a bit of a context. Uh, I mean, do you know what it feels like to be sitting in your home peacefully and then get shattered, literally shattered by an explosion, right? And I'm living in Dubai, so I wasn't among the people who, uh, uh, who suffered from this explosion. And then the, the first thing I started hearing is that people, so you had around 200 people dying and, and the media and most of the people on the streets start calling them martyrs. Now for any Lebanese person, unfortunately, this is something normal. These people died for a cause. And I got really upset because that is the fundamental issue in Lebanon, all right? And I guess elsewhere as well. So think about it this way. I mean, there's a girl who, whose, whose name is Alexandra. She's three years old. She died in that explosion. She's an innocent victim. Why in the world would we call her a martyr, right? A martyr is someone who sacrifices himself for a cause, for a political cause or a, a religious cause, right? Like, she didn't sacrifice herself. She didn't ask for, uh, to be sacrificed. She's a victim. And I guess it's the first time that the word victim stands uh, for yeah, its real meaning, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And, and not just her, so many people died and lost their houses and we're calling them martyrs. Now, my main problem is, is really how we think about the words, how we think about the, the, the concepts we use in Lebanon. And it starts with basic words like martyrs, like freedom. Like, what do you mean by freedom? So you have so many people, they go on the street, I'm, I'm just going to give you an example now, and they ask for freedom. But what exactly do you mean? To give you a, another brief uh, uh, example, in August 2019, there was a rock band who was planning to uh, sing in one of the most famous festivals in Lebanon. And suddenly they got attacked by members of the church and politicians and, you know, different people because they were atheists, okay? Now, this is a band that is, I think, 10 years old. They started very small and they grew global. Their name is Mashua Laila. And, you know, this, some people, you know, stood to defend for their right of freedom of speech, but they didn't revolt. They didn't go on the street. 
it's not a big deal, you know, it's just freedom of speech. After a couple of months, in October 2019, right, people went on the street because the government said, I'm going to put taxation on WhatsApp. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not defending the government. The government has no right, in my view, to add taxation to, to WhatsApp or whatever. Uh, nor I'm saying that this is the only reason why they went to the streets. Obviously, these people, some of them are really under poverty, unemployment. They're fed up with the government. So, so the WhatsApp was a flame. But the WhatsApp was a flame, and freedom of speech wasn't. You see, and that's my problem with how we think about the words. And that's why I focused on, in that specific situation, on the word martyrs. We keep calling them martyrs. They're not martyrs. Yeah, that's usually like Raka's line, which says that philosophy is important and definitions are important and concepts are, are important. That's right. Absolutely. So, by the way, Raka, you jump in in whichever line you think you have something to, you want to comment on. So I'll, I'll move to the next one. I will not ask the government to feed me, nor to control my economy or property or ideas. I am free, free to think, free to express myself, free to produce and keep the values that I create. So I like, he, this is where basically you, it's what you said, free to think like the band, free to express myself, but also free to produce and keep the values that I create. And that's, I think, the problem with many people and many of our, let's say, allies in the free speech wars or in the culture wars with our allies in the left, that they understand and they go to the barricades for free. Sometimes it's the opposite. They go to the barricades for free speech. But then when it comes to big businesses, it doesn't matter anymore. It's, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think you, qu you find quite more often the, the other way Round. So, uh, in a way, I appreciate people who who protested against uh, against uh, WhatsApp. But also, you see this in Greece among conservatives. So they will, for example, they are against wokeness, or they see what's happening in the culture wars outside of Greece. But then, when someone becomes blasphemous, then they kind of uh, they kind of yeah. uh, freak out. Yeah, we have uh, allies in the cause for free speech that downplay the importance of property rights and economic liberty. And then we have uh, allies in the cause for economic liberty who don't appreciate the importance, the importance of philosophy, of ideas. And that is what gives rise to the, to the, um, d the right to free speech. I mean, it's, it's tied to the right to think freely. It's because human <laughs> nature requires reason, requires first-handed observation and um, you know, independent thought and debate and discussion in order to arrive at truth. I mean, these are things that life requires qua human beings. If we, de if we skip over that and just jump right to free speech, it's easy for someone else to come along and, and kind of, ex and make the kind of utilitarian argument against free speech and say, well, we don't need perfect free speech because it doesn't benefit society, they would say. So, uh, philosophy stands or falls as a whole. We need to kind of, um, we, we need to kind of uh, integrate all these various elements, economic liberty, free speech, the right to think, the right to, to uh, produce, um, or else we're just going to lose all of it. Absolutely. And it's almost like a mind-body dichotomy. Like I was really listening to Gold's speech, and he says this, uh, that, uh, that's a very good point that he makes, that if you defend freedom but not the right to property it's basically you're saying i should be free to do things but not in the real world yeah anyway. in the, yeah, in, yeah, the book, in the book yeah, that on. we like and we recommend often uh the the new left or its newer version the the return of the primitive which is a collection of essays by ayn, ayn rand um she talks about the berkeley riots i think in the late 60s where they were demanding free speech free speech and Rand points out, I think, um, without property rights, like, I mean, free speech just becomes kind of unintelligible. You, you don't know, where do you have a right to speak? I once saw uh, Dave Rubin on stage with a bunch of uh, rowdy college kids interrupting him. And as they're interrupting him, they're saying, wait, what's, what's the problem? It's free speech. I'm interrupting you because it's free speech. And, you know, Rubin, uh, for as much as we might love him, he's, he's not an objectivist or he's not even a a property rights hawk like we are. And he says, 
He said something like, well, well, I'm speaking now, so wait for me to finish. And then after I'm done, you can go. That's your answer to somebody interrupting you that, that, that free speech means waiting for the other person to finish? No, the answer should have been, I'm, I was the one invited to speak on this stage by the people who rented it out for me. So you need to shut your mouth until I grant you the floor. That's how I might have answered it, maybe in a nicer way than that. Um, and yeah, because we, 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 we like property rights and we like entrepreneurship, I encourage people to donate to the show. And if they do so, we're going to have a whole, a whole show with Raga where we do voice impersonations because I like <laughs> this kind of Dame Ruby Echo. I, I can do... I can do Jordan Peterson and Hans Hermann Hoppe. So it's going to be an interesting uh, discussion. Ooh, so that, that I want to see. <laughs> okay. So the next, the next line. I before, to... before you move uh, on the next yeah, line, yeah. I just want to give a context here. I think it's important. Uh, so one of the reasons, so I've never commented on anything on Lebanon. Never. Right. Like, I've written like five articles and kept them for myself throughout these years. I've never published anything, never commented. But when this happened, I, f I felt a strong need to write this oath uh, because I think this process of thinking of an oath, thinking of a commitment and, a, and an individual commitment is crucial, right, in order for you to know where you're heading or how you want to change the government, or what you want to achieve. Because you really have to introspect. And one of the main problems that at least I see in Lebanon is that we're always very quick at attacking others, or we're always against something. We're against this party, we're against this government, we're against these politicians, but we don't know what we stand for. And to know what you stand, what you should stand for, or what you stand for, you should rework your definitions. You should rework your, your words. And when you go on the street and ask the government to feed you and to become like a service company, well, you're committing the same mistake. Even if you change the political class, you're going back to the root of the problem. And that's why I wanted to express this. And of course, here I'm hinting of state church separation, but as well as state economy uh, separation. Uh, but I don't have to go through all of this uh, in the oath. But, but really, the whole idea is trying to inspire first myself and other people that, you know, think about your demands. We, you need to have a vision before you go on the streets and revolt uh, against whatever system or government. And that idea sounds good also, basically doing an oath to yourself sometimes, so trying mm. to codify what are my main values. But I'll go on with it because, again, we're probably we're not going to be able to analyze it in detail, but I want to go through it and I'll stop at some point. I will not follow any political party blindly. From now on, reason is my guide and the truth is my companion. I will never again surrender my mind to mindless brutes. I will never again live as a tribe. I will live by the rule of law, not of men. I will live and trade with others voluntarily for mutual benefits and will not initiate force on anyone. So give us a bit context here. What's the difference between live as a tribe? So what's the link between living as a tribe and the rule of men? So why is individualism properly understood related to the rule of law, whereas tribalism related to the rule of, of men? So first, you have to understand that Lebanon is a tribe, is a, uh, like 18 different tribes, like big tribe. And that's how they live. Right? And it's so hard. And that's how we were all raised. And it's so hard for you to separate yourself from that tribe, whether the tribe is a specific sect or a specific uh, uh, political party. And by doing so, you're uh, ultimately surrendering yourself to the head of the tribe. If he says you know, this is the truth, then it must be the truth. You have to follow him blindly. And you, you, you can't say, no, I disagree, because then you'll be kicked out of the party, and nobody does that. Now, gladly, I think many people uh, during this revolution understood there's something wrong. You know, we've tried these people for 40, 45 uh, years, right? They're the same people. Um, uh, whereby if, if you, and by the way, we, we really don't have objective law. In Lebanon. It's a complete mess. And actually, a couple of days ago, I heard someone who used to be the, uh, the minister of, of justice or something like that. 
And he had a command saying that he was looking at the, uh, um, the draft international uh, uh, committee that is uh, investigating with the Hariri assassination. And he said, you know what, I was looking at the draft and throughout these 15 years and taking this draft and going to this political party and showing them the, the draft. Because, yeah, we care about justice, but we care more about collaboration between us and understanding between us. And that's the price, you see. And there is no freedom without justice, right? There is no reason without justice. So, so that's what's happening. That's what's happening in Lebanon. Okay, so, uh, give me a second because I've lost yeah. my Zoom. Oh no, now I'm back. Okay, so I'll go to the to the next uh, to the uh, Raka. Anything on uh, on tribalism? Yeah, uh, we are seeing it rise everywhere, and even in a ba you know relatively very much relatively free and enlightened country like America or any other Western country, we see w when when people are kind of getting back to their deepest values. It culturally, it usually means connecting with family, looking to their ancestors, uh, coming to turn, you know, uh, getting to know the customs of their extended tribe, basically. We, tribalism is very much in the culture everywhere in the world. We need to be aware of that and to understand where that comes from and that there are much more important values than what your, what your grandparents happen to wear and, and the music they listen to. Well, but it's at the same time, it's so difficult, specifically when it comes to your country and your family, it's, it's difficult. So I, I've written something on tribalism and in the opening pages, I said, I'm writing literally a book on tribalism, but when I see Greece, for example, playing football and I listen to the national anthem, I get goosebumps or when a Greek athlete wins in the Olympics, I get like teary eyed. Now there's a way to rationalize this and to say, for example, well, it's, you know, it's, I project in this, my family and my memories, but make no mistake, tribalism is very, very strong. So it's not even it's tribalism necessarily. I mean, those are your values and there's nothing wrong with that, but there are things more, there are things deeper than that. And so you need to kind of place that in your uh, hierarchy of values and to understand that, you know, this flag and this national anthem does not give you your identity. It does not give you value. It's the kind of the other way around. I actually want to give you a quick example on tribalism in, in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, because really it's a matter of method as well. It's not just, uh, you know, the ideas you hold. So for example, during the revolution, when these are the people revolting against the government, uh, I don't know who came up with this idea that we need to change the political class and we need to bring in technocrat. Now, here's the, the, the tribalistic mentality. Everyone started ch chanting techro technocrat and we want technocracy. But what does that even mean? You know, nobody understood. And the problem is, is that because they created a tribe that, you know, we are revolting against the government. So here we are a tribe, someone brought in a new word and it, uh, you know, conveys some technology, right? And some elite uh, scientists and it must be good. Let's put it, uh, you know, into action. The, the reason I'm laughing is all this reminds me so much of Greece. Of Greece. So the Greece, in Greece, the liberals, for those of you who are listening to this and can't see, I'm putting many air quotes, so the liberals, their big thing since the crisis was, we need to become more like Europe. And also they cheered for technocracy. And what was technocracy was basically a state which would be more intervening, but more <laughs> modern. So for yeah. example, what was the first thing that the Bigger. government of liberals did? They implemented the smoking ban in people's private property like bars and cafes because they do it in Europe. And when are we going to become Europe? Now, in my opinion, these are the worst. The, like, the, these are the worst second hunters because at least the leftists are telling you, like, uh, you know, I have this idea and because of this, this is good. These people don't even do this. They say, oh, someone else is doing something, therefore we should do it. Like, that's, that's the lowest level of, of, of non-ideological and non-political non-political thinking. So yeah, uh, technocrats, no good. 
Anyway, let's go, to, <laughs> let's go to the end of the, towards the end of the all. I understand with full clarity that the only way to achieve all this is by developing a new secular constitution that limits the role of government to the protection of my individual rights, regardless of my religion, race, gender, or ideology. My official army will be the only institution responsible for the use of force in my defense. I swear that from, the moment, from this moment on, I will choose to build myself and my country in my vision, a vision of reason, freedom, and a glorified sense of individuality. So basically, here we, here we enter also on the political aspect of this code of values, which is government as opposed to anarchy, or as opposed to tribes that fight each other, which is the equivalent yes. of, of... So for people who don't understand or who lack the historical context, in Lebanon, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are huge areas where basically the official government is not the government, it's Hezbollah and their yes. militias, so, which is not, not very far from, uh, from uh, anarchy. And also, what you said, one official ar army. So, one, so basically, one body that can use coercive force and defensively. And I like the end, where you say a glorified sense of individuality. So you build yourself and your country based on the vision. And this vision is a glorified sense of individuality. Now, we live in times where so many people say, oh, we're all so atomized, oh, individualism everywhere. So what do you mean by glorified sense of individuality? And how is this different from the world we are experiencing today? Well, the first thing is really uh, uh, thinking for yourself and thinking what is your identity. You see, we have a big problem when it comes to identity in Lebanon. You have one, one sect, I would say, they consider them Arabs. And another sect, they say, no, 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 we're Phoenician. You know, maybe that's, that's better. And always your identity is linked either to the sect or to the geography or to this, again, collective uh, idea. But no one has the sense, or very few, actually, and in Lebanon, you find really very intelligent people. And I think they're doing great work uh, uh, nowadays, fighting the government and fighting the system. But what I wanted to focus on is really to go to the fundamental and think what really basic, what makes me an individual, what makes, what gives me my identity, and from there on you can build a group and a society and a government that protects you as an individual. So always the, the outcome should go back to you as an individual and each individual alone, right? And that's what I wanted to, uh, because we don't have that sense, right, of a glorified individualism. We don't have, even this concept is so abstract, it's so hard to explain it in a couple of minutes, what does individualism mean? So. So, but again, I think it all ties together because, w I mean, some people tried, for example, to bring in civil marriage, right? And that's a great step. And I had a discussion with someone who's really smart, and I tried to convey the idea that, yes, that's an important step. But we need to go back and think in fundamentals, and we need to say, no, no, the whole system should be secular. Else, you might get the civil marriage, whatever that would look like, but you'll never get the fundamental issue. You will not, never get a secular government that will leave you free to think and, you know, uh, trade with other people. So that's, that's the issue. Makes, uh, makes, makes sense. And uh, I think confusing this idea that, oh, I want the world to kind of obey to my whims just because I want it to, that's actually the opposite of individual. The individual, the individualist understands the world and see himself or herself as an agent in this world, not yeah. as kind of a narcissistic subject. Raka, yes, it's up to you to finish off the episode on a on a high note. On a happy, optimistic note, I think Leopold. He's uh, leading by example. He is a concretization for people to actually witness and see, oh, that's what it looks like to be an individual who's passionate, value-driven, and has a corollary political system he's proposing to carry that out. And, um, and art, of course, serves this, uh, among other things, serves that same purpose. And you think of Ayn Rand's characters. They love the United States. 
but it's not about geography. It's not about bloodline. It's, it's not about those trivialities, although there's nothing wrong with trivialities that you have. I'm a very sentimental guy. You look around me, I've got old things from childhood sitting around, but there are things much deeper than that, like the uh, principles to live by and values that go deeper than, than objects and things like that. I will try to quote Ayn Rand in her final speech, Ayn Rand quoting a televangelist on TV who said, the best way to help the poor is not to be one of them. I think that was the quote. And I will offer you that the best way to help Lebanon is to understand the, 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 the philosophy that they need and to live it in your own life, to advocate it in your own country. And believe me, if you, if you can uh, change your own country where you're living, I think Lebanon will get the memo eventually and you can lead by example. Mm. Many sayings now in my head. Maybe the best way to help your quote tribe is not to be a tribalist and be an individual. But anyway, may maybe yeah, that's yeah. Not... All right. Yeah, so, Leopold, any, uh, any last words? Where can people follow your work and when can they keep in touch with what you're doing? So before my word, I want to end also on a, on a kind of paraphrasing rant because I think this is really important. Somewhere she says, you know, uh, this is a battle for nothing, nothing less than your soul. And really, really, this is it at the end of the day, whether in Lebanon and elsewhere, it's a battle for, for this. So that's why I think all of us, we have to sit down and rethink our words and our values etc. So as for my work, uh, you know, I'm mostly on all the different uh, social media platform, mainly on Instagram and LinkedIn, uh, Novel Philosophy Academy or Leopold Ajami. And I'd love to see you all there. We, we launch a couple of, uh, we're launching a couple of new workshops now on conversations and a couple of interesting things as well. We'll reveal it later. Oh, yeah. yeah, and uh, again, I've been in some of these workshops and I got a lot of value out of it. And also it shows how, how high should the bar be for people who are engaged with ideas. Like you'll see that nothing in Leopold workshop is, let's say, everything has too much attention has been paid to everything from the slides to how you go from the one slide to the other side to your interaction with the audience. So. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leopold. Uh, Thank you, I guys. I appreciate the work you are doing. I hope that this uh, oath will be, or some aspects of it are going to be part of Lebanon's future. So from me, from Raka, and from our guest, Leopold, all the best and have a good weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.